Okay, so here we are, uh, day six. Am I right on day six? Mm -hmm. Day six of our still life painting demonstration. Um, I, as I jump into today's work, I don't have any like new ideas. Um, there's nothing that stands out that's outrageous to me. Sometimes <clears throat> I'll jump into a painting and I know that there's areas that aren't working and I have to move shapes and I just a lot, a lot of exploration to be done. Uh, but right now in this painting, uh, I'm enjoying myself. I'm pretty happy with it. There's nothing that's standing out to me as being egregiously wrong. Uh, there are areas that aren't necessarily clicking, uh, but that's not because I feel as if there's like friction in the gears, so to speak. I just have to keep working. So um, I don't want to complicate something. And so I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, I am making a quick change. And if you look over here, there's a very small change, but I felt like there's a, I don't know, I don't like groups of four, um, not as a rule. So I would never say to artists, hey, you, you can't, you can only have odd number, uh, odd numbers. Um, I don't think that's like necessarily, I don't like that. <laughs> that's all I can say. So you can have four of an object, but somehow the placement of this one, two, three, four, it just feels too even, like one, two, three, four. Um, I don't like it, I'm not crazy about it. I haven't been crazy about it from the beginning. And yet I want each one of these to sit where they are sitting. So then my idea was, I think I'm gonna put an egg back here. The other thing I haven't liked is that these two eggs feel so similar in terms of shape and orientation. That's why I haven't really masked this egg in. And so what I'll probably do is take one of these eggs and maybe point it more as if it's like looking over the side or something like that. Um, not really 100% sure on that guy. I will get to that eventually, but I'm gonna put like another shell right here. So let's switch over to the other camera view. And if you wanna zoom in close with me, we'll take a look at <laughs> somehow that. Okay, our other camera view is upside down. Give me one moment, Facebook world. I put the camera in the module or in the holder incorrectly. Sorry about that. Okay, so if you look uh, right here, and if we zoom in, um, there's an empty space, it's a void. Uh, it's fine that it's that empty, but I just kind of want another element right here. And what I like about that, I don't want to completely block that alleyway. What I like about that is this is light on dark. This is kind of light on dark. This is light on, well, it's light on dark on light, but this, th there's a lot of sameness going on here. And then back here, I've made this area so light over here that we have the potential that it could sit in the shadow and yet create a silhouette back there. Um, it's just visual interest to me. And so that's the first thing I'm jumping into today. And I'll just start painting. So jumping back over here to the palette, I've already transported all of my colors from before the weekend and I put them out on the palette. And I'll talk a little bit um, about what colors I'm using. Uh, we have new people tuning in and I kind of get a steady stream of uh, messages asking what palette I use. And I'll have it set up uh, in the future so that you can more easily access it. But for the time being, Kremnitz White, Naples Yellow Deep, Roman Ochre, um, Venetian Red, Chinese Vermilion, Ivory Black, Burnt Umber, Cadmium Yellow, Cadmium Orange, Cadmium Red, uh, King's Blue, Cobalt Blue, Ultramarine Blue Deep. And those colors that I have out, um, I could go brand by brand, but I kind of want to jump forward so you can see me painting. So here we go. Um, I'm going to start out with a little bit of putting, I sometimes put a little bit of medium out just to get the flow of something. Now that egg back there, as I'm looking over at it, it is really, really dark. Um, if I err on one side or another, it's to go too dark. 
and just putting a tiny bit of Chinese vermilion in there. When I look over, I see red in that shadow. And again, there's an idea in painting. Uh, it's an idea, and I don't want to present it as being a formula truth that has to be applied to everything. But the idea is that um, the truest color is in the halftone. And I think that when I look at my subject in front of me, don't ever, um, with color, I think it's a mistake to become a slave to concepts like that and to have all your shadows turn into like one uniform brown. Um, I think that's really, I think that's unfortunate. Um, and it can lead to a lot of perfunctory, drab areas of a painting. But that being said, I do see much more choice color in areas like this than um, in areas like this. So, you know, it's a principle, but don't, don't go overboard with it. Look for, look for pleasing moments uh, where you can. And there's an artist who I, I really deeply admire his work, uh, Mark Alessio. And he says, um, when you're looking at nature, and you're kind of unsure of what something is or how to gauge it. And I apologize that I'm, I'm repeating this terribly. I'm paraphrasing it terribly. But he says, error on the side of beauty. And I really like that a lot. And so I've, I'm gonna put in more of a choice color than I am just like a drab, and I, a drab kind of brown or something like that. So there's a punch of in here. There's even like a bit of orange in that. And I'm not really following what I see over here in nature all that closely. Um, not really following it that closely because nature is not really doing anything that I find so interesting. Um, and I, I don't, I don't want to put in anything in such a central position of the painting that doesn't um, relate well with everything else. So as I say, every time we jump into painting together, um, please feel free to chime in with questions and comments. And just going for that egg, the white of the egg in shadow, there's quite a bit of blue in it, it's kind of surprising. So I'll put a little bit more King's Blue in here. And just going in. I'm aware that it's not gonna really read against the wood in the background, but that's totally fine. I don't need for that to read. It can get lost at that point. Um, okay, so standing and staring. Um, one of the things I'm confronted with today is it's a very, very overcast day um, here in New York. So it's extremely overcast today. Uh, it doesn't make for bad painting. Um, like I've said before, I think beginners um, in painting, they look for consistency and constancy because they think that um, the game of painting or the act of painting is, is just trying to capture stasis and trying to capture, let's, say, let's just put it in two dimensional terms, trying to capture two dimensional shapes so as to represent reality. Um, but that mindset with painting um, evolves as you go along. And instead of trying to just capture something in front of you, you try to understand what's in front of you. And so it doesn't matter the light on the, on the different days because there's a really beautiful quality of shadow coming off of these objects today that is absolutely perfect. Um, so you just embrace each day for what it is. An overcast day of painting, if you're not experienced, you look at your model, your figure model in front of you, and you just like, be mowing the whole entire time. Oh, the model's so dark. Oh, I can't see anything today. Oh, it's terrible. But when you mature as an artist, you say the quality of light and the softness of the transitions are perfect today. And it's really great. And then when you do get your sunny day, the softness of those transitions aren't there anymore. It's more of a jarring um, plane break or no transition. I'll just use the same word. 
transitions are more jarring, but then you can take the color from the best day. So why am I saying this? Because there is no light back here today. This is murky as can be behind here. Um, I have to make up what I want to see here. And that is my point that I'm trying to make. On this overcast day, I have to choose to see here what I want to see here. I'm not gonna find it by just looking at it. So understanding is leading me to paint what my eyes can observe. So let me just jump into that background. And as I speak to you, my sons are outside of the window playing in the garden, moving stuff. It's so cute. And they all have their Irish caps on. Okay, so I want to carve. I can't really do much more to make this egg to make sense of this. I'm going to check to see that I like this color. I actually really like the color I just mixed up. That's perfect. And I'm going to double back here and now I'm going to carve out this silhouette back here. But I have to be mindful of one thing. That object is further away than this one. And if that object is further away, um, even though as I look at it, if I look back there, I can see sharps. If I step back and I look at everything, this is a million times sharper than that is. So I have to think of my focal point. So I'm gonna go in right here. And that is my focal point back there. I mean, uh, that is my focal point. So back here is not my focal point. And so I'm gonna let those transitions just become very, very gentle. Now, I, I jump into things like this all the time. And all the time, um, I'll put something in like that and constantly, constantly, um, I will look at it and I'll be like, okay, I had the impulse and it was a terrible idea. Um, I don't really care because if it's a terrible idea, I'll just change it. So I'm going to um, step back and take a look at it. But first I can see that we have two questions. Um, are you thinking of adding more detail to the door? Yeah, so that's a great question. That's from uh, Tony Ann, uh, or Jim Vardasher, but uh, um, from Tony Ann. And so all this information back here, uh, everything through here, um, I'm going to wait to see how the foreground develops before I really go too much into the background. So my, my inclination, is, is uh, definitely, yes, that definitely I'll be putting more detail into the door. Um, it's just, it's too interesting a door for, um, it's too interesting a door for it to just not play um, a role up there. And you see those little circular knobs? I don't know if I can get them into the composition, but I really, really want to. They're just funky and they're weird and they're, they're just kind of cool. Um, I'm going to speak about something that sounds totally irrelevant. Uh, when I was, Margaret and I were first married, we moved to Chile and we went and we visited the house of Pablo Neruda. Uh, Pablo Neruda is definitely one of my favorite poets. Um, and so the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda had a house on the Pacific Ocean in the hills of Valparaiso overlooking the ocean. And the house is just filled, um, it's now a museum. Um, and the house is just filled with the oddities that he acquired when, when for many years he served as a diplomat for the Chinese, uh, Chinese Chilean government. But his house is just, just, just filled with texture. Everything in it, like old wood doors, carved masts, portals that were rusting. It was just oddities and absurdities and none of it made any sense. And it was, in my whole life, one of my favorite spaces I ever walked into. Um, but the textures and how these things speak to each other, the texture of this cast iron will never truly be brought out. The, the smoothness of this surface is heightened by the crustiness of the wood door. And the crunchiness of the paper bag is heightened by the smoothness of the creamer. So all these textures 
definitely, definitely will be brought to play uh, between now and the end. I just don't know how far yet. Um, so to jump over to another metaphor, this is my main melody right here. That is my background. And you hear this all the time. I love using um, different composers as an example. And one composer who used uh, textures in such a great way was Tchaikovsky. And when you have these sleepy, washy passages, and then he'd have his star melody emerge from that. So this is kind of like my atmospheric passage right here. That's my star melody. But once I have a better idea of what's going on here, I'm gonna double back and double back, and they're gonna play off of each other. So that was a great question. And is there another question? And, okay, so another question is, let's see here, are you going to take out the egg in the foreground? Oh, so uh, this egg right here, am I going to take this one out? Um, I don't know, um, because I still am thinking of putting the spoon right here. Um, actually, probably I'm being a little bit lazy at this point by not putting it in yet. And then I'm going to know if this is clutter. Um, my leaning is, is uncertain because I like that egg so close to the edge. Um, it's kind of fun. It creates like this uh, tension. So <laughs> um, I want to leave it in, but then compositionally, it might just be like too much like a ping pong ball, like boom, bing, boom, bing, boom. Like, I don't know. So I'm going to say. So, okay, jumping back to the canvas, sipping some coffee. Um, as I look, I really like that egg that I put in. Um, I think it's great. I think it works really well. And it just needs to be carved out a little bit more. So I'm hitting the background right here even a little bit more yet. And then I might go a little bit lighter right here to pop the silhouette of the white of the egg. So I'm really just going with a washed out brown gray and see what this does for me. Again, these transitions don't have to be strong at all. They can be really, really gentle. Um, that's not reading yet. So I'll just go a little bit lighter. that the egg itself has to go a little bit darker. So I'm kind of I'm using the same brush and actually really similar colors to flip back and forth um, between the white of the egg and the background, but I really see them as being, as participating in each other. So I made that darker up there to really read against it. I don't know that the shape makes perfect sense, but I, I do really like the value. I think the value, th these transitions, I think it took a moment that was otherwise just kind of quiet and nothing special. And I think it brought a, yet another moment of visual interest. And okay, so I've kind of like masked that in. I've been thinking for a while that my cast shadow coming off the back, so back here, that it, it's a little too high and it could come just a hair lower, and that will only serve to, to pop the value of this egg silhouette a little bit more. I can't go too low because then I'm implying that the footprint of this is, is, uh, is just too small, but that's better. So now, that shape isn't perfect. I, I don't really care. I'll fix it in a while. Um, I'm really looking at how these values pop each other and how much do I want them to pop. So definitely want to keep 
if you were able to see super, super close right here, what you would see is that my transitions are very, very, very soft. I mean, unbelievably soft transitions back here. Um, I'm feathering every single external contour to make sure that it's the most gentle, softest transition. And I ask you to, um, to do this with me um, another week, but I think do it again in the comfort of your own home and your own studio. Put your hand in front of your face and look at your hand and notice how everything behind your hand um, becomes soft. So that's called field of vision. So the field of vision is when your left and your right eye, when they converge, think of your eyes as being lines. When you focus your two lines of vision, center on that focus, right? So if it's the case that you have two lines of vision converging right here, everything else behind it is soft. So why am I saying that? This has to stay razor sharp and that has to go super soft. If that stays super sharp, then the field of vision is ruined and the focus in the piece is ruined. Um, even painters who paint a uh, pretty, I want to say tight, like Vermeer. Vermeer, even though, um, again, his work stays really tight, he has focus and the areas that are unimportant are softer and the areas um, within the field of vision are oftentimes sharper. That's a generalization. You can find exceptions to it all over it in the course of one painting. But generally speaking, take a look at Vermeer's work and look at how you'll have the milkmaid pouring the milk into the um, container. And then look at the little floor tiles. They have, instead of a boring drab wood baseboard like we have here in uh, New England, um, they have little Delft tiles that are hand painted blue tiles but they're soft and they're painted in, very, in a very smoky way so that they don't overpower the milkmaid who's actually pouring. So um, take a look at that painting, it's really nice view. I think we have another question. And is it acrylic painting? Okay, so Leonardo Tomas um, just asks, is this a, an acrylic painting? Uh, no, this is an oil painting. Um, I paint in oils. Um, for two reasons. One, I just inherently love oils for what they are. And two, I have, I have worked with acrylic before, but I haven't kept up with them because there's been such, um, there's, there have been so many advances in the medium of acrylic. I have a friend who works um, entirely in acrylic and his paintings are outstanding. I mean, he, he gets really beautiful work, but um, he, he exploits in acrylic, he exploits almost like the matted, flat, um, I can't put my, I can't verbalize it, but he, he takes advantage of what acrylic paint is and he incorporates it into his, into his statement, into his aesthetic. Um, I play around a lot with um, the thinness and the thickness of, of oil paint and the transparency of oil paint, which to my knowledge is not really the game of acrylic painting, but you might um, you might be more familiar with advances in acrylic. I know that in the past five years, the acrylic paint has changed so radically that it's um, a far cry from what I was working with 10, 15 years ago. So this is entirely oil, and um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. So jumping back over here, I'm not gonna really dwell on that area too much longer because um, I don't wanna, I don't wanna overthink it. I wanna be looking all over the canvas. Um, I do like, whoops, I'm, I was holding the wrong brush and I hit the wrong thing. Um, I do like how the light on the door right there popped off the valley of the side of the milk. I like that a lot. So that was before dark on dark and now it's light on dark. Um, I really, really like what happened there. And I gotta be perfectly honest, that was 100% an accident. I did not plan that out. But I think so much of painting is paying attention to, um, geez, I don't wanna sound like Bob Ross here, but paying attention to uh, accidents, happy accidents. Geez, that's terrible, but you know, the guy was right. Um, do any of you guys know the story of how the telephone was invented? 
Alexander Graham Bell. Actually, I think we're like, we have a one minute disconnect, so I think your comments aren't gonna come through. So, I'm gonna jump into the story of Alexander Graham Bell, and um, I'll try to make it quick so I can keep painting. Alexander Graham Bell was um, in his laboratory, and I'm not saying this was the first phone ever, but in this, in this area of the world, um, he had a phone set up between different rooms, and he couldn't get it to work. And his assistant, several rooms away, knocked over um, a vat of acid and spilled some on himself and screamed and went like, ah! And when he screamed, Alexander Graham Bell, several rooms away, never would have been able to hear that scream through their device that they had set up, which they thought was not working, heard a voice. And he runs over to the other room, guy's clutching his arm, I'm adding a little color to the story, and he said, what was that? And he said, I spilled acid on myself. And he's like, no, what was that? And he goes over and he realizes that that their telephone that they built, which they thought was broken uh, or just never worked, um, it actually worked. So what the heck am I talking about here? So much of innovation, so much of growth is paying attention to accidents and paying it to, looking at your medium and letting your medium tell you whether it is or is not working. So many times as I paint, I put down paint in order to, in order to obtain a certain effect, whatever it might be, and I step back and I go, oh, I didn't even intend for that to happen, but I accidentally, in putting that down, showed myself that that works better over here. Everything informs the next step, and as painters, we have to really be I think we have to proceed with a humility <laughs> and, and um, an openness to um, an openness to I can't quite put it into words, but maybe to chaos and letting that chaos inform our paintings. That just happened for me right here. I was going to leave that all pretty dark and murky, but now that the light is up against there, this whole entire side of the milk container looks so much cooler. I mean, that looks a million times better. So I'm constantly learning that my own work. So uh, something I forgot to do in the beginning because I was so excited to jump into the egg um, was I forgot to oil out. I'm going to do a little bit of oiling out over here uh, because I noticed that my values are sunken in. Um, so I'm just putting a little bit of oil. And the way to check the oil content is to stand and look at glare coming off the side of it and seeing if it kind of has like that healthy oily not an oil slick not soaking wet but just enough oil where it's not matted so i'm just going to do that quickly over here there's enough oil in other spots but this right over here i should have done this right at the beginning but i jumped into other things Okay, so that actually changes the area quite a bit. Okay, so now I'm stepping back. I really like what has happened on that side. Um, I don't have a clear game plan. I just know that the light on here, uh, right over here, it's a whole lot brighter here, but remember it's still soft on that far side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get another brush out and I try to kind of pick out the brush that I think might be the size of the stroke. So that might be a little bit too small, but I think this is going to be the perfect size right here. And I see a whole lot of, this is a very washed out highlight. There's not much color in it today. The other day there was green and blue in it, but it needs to go brighter here. And that feels a lot better. And then it needs to go brighter on the far side, but it needs to remain, maintain that softness. So I'm putting in this 
highlight, but I'm softening it as well. And remember, the more you soften something, the more you diminish its value. So if you put down paint, and um, let's say you put down pure white paint and pure black paint, um, that pure white paint, if you blend it, uh, if you regard paint as being, um, let's say, peaks and valleys, so if this is white and it's all the way at the top, top and it's really bright, and if this is black and it's really resonant and dark, um, and let's say you just start blending it, the more you blend it, the, the, the more the peaks are going to be lowered and the valleys are going to be filled until everything is just, instead of being the Rocky Mountains, it's Kansas, it's just flat. Um, why does that matter? Because if I put down a really bright highlight and then I soften it and soften it, with every stroke, that highlight is getting darker. So you have to remember that about the quality of the impostos that you put down, the value you put down. The more you blend it, the darker it's going to become until it's just flat. It just becomes a mid-tone. So really I'm speaking specifically about impostos there. And it still is even brighter yet, right here. Okay, so that area of the painting, when I first started painting today, looked pretty drab to me. And now I'm really pleased with it. Um, this logo right here is supposed to have been spun over. That area with that logo is really cool and it's going to require its own like maybe two hours of painting um maybe I, I would spend 40 minutes on it but what i mean is it will it a two hour block will be devoted to that area and bouncing off of it so now as i stand back here and i look um i don't think i should jump into that logo just quite yet but i do think that i should kind of mass in the general idea. The, I guess what it is, is that the raw ground, the gray of the, I'm sorry, the um, umber ground, the brown, is kind of disconnecting with everything else going on in here. So maybe I will mass in a bit more information so it just doesn't bother my eye the way that it is right now. And painting with a fair amount of Demeyer medium, courtesy of Eric from Blue Ridge Oil Colors. He's an awesome guy. He shipped that off to me in the midst of a pandemic. And massing over here. Uh, went a little bit too light, so I'm going to go just a bit darker. Uh, especially today, where it's so overcast, everything is, is very... The colors are not in this silver. They're not resonant. Uh, I'm sorry, within this glass, it's very silver. The colors aren't resonant. Um, I'm not saying that colors don't stand out on uh, overcast days, because on overcast days, the greens in a garden have never looked so green because they're not being hit with uh, direct light. They're not being washed out at all. So sometimes an overcast day uh, can have the, the most subtle color and the richest in, in its own way. Um, but that's not going on here right now uh, because the brown base of this wood is not coming through today. So everything is pretty silver. So I think there's a question. Uh, to get a bright highlight, would I consider, so Carolyn Dorigo, um, Christian Dorigo, um, is asking, to get a bright highlight, would I use the dentist tool? Uh, yeah, if it's, if it's like kind of a, a sharp highlight. So um, I've been waiting for this. So now is the perfect time to jump in and do it. Um, we, let me quickly pop my vest off. So right up here, there are a series of real sharp sharps, uh, sharp highlights, sorry. And those sharp highlights up here, 
definitely can be painted in, but get really close to a Rembrandt painting. Get as close as you can get before the guards start yelling at you. And look at the some of the highlights he puts in. You can see that Rembrandt would scratch in certain passages. So what I will do in certain passages is scratch right back to the very ground of the paint. It doesn't really show up there. Um, I think it probably would have a, we'd have a hard time making that show up on the internet. But if you were in the room with me and you saw me scratching this, uh, you would notice these little silvery kind of like highlights popping off. And I probably will do it a little bit, like right here, there's some lettering. I don't at all care what the lettering says, but going in like this and scratching in. So that is something I do really often in my paintings where I, I go in and I scratch the, the actual ground of the canvas itself. And I like the effect that it has. It's something that can never be painted in. And so maybe you can see right here, it's this subtractive end of painting. So additive is the end of painting where you're putting on more paint. But the subtractive end of painting, um, it just brings a whole different quality to it. And again, these are things that can't be put into words. But I think it might be productive if I grab this camera and come even closer. So I think I might pop the camera and here we are and go even closer yet. So let me just do this quickly, just like that. And again, hard to pick up over the live stream quality of the internet. Okay, but you can see right there, it's this really crisp and yet scratchy kind of effect. And I love doing that in certain areas, especially where it's almost like ornamentation. And I, say, I talk about this a lot in my classes, but you gotta remember that when the abstract painters, let's just bring up a year, like 1940s, when the abstract painters were really advocating for playing with paint, for playing with paint's sake, um, part of what they were responding to was how stiff and stoic and stuffy um, painting had become in the hands of the Edwardians, um, the, the painters who were just painting um, the Boston Brahmin, um, different periods. I'm not talking about the stars, like, Paxton, whose work is exquisite. I'm not talking about John Singer Sargent. I just mean some people who came along, um, they interpreted the ages that came before them and they just rendered the life out of things in a very cold and a frozen activity. And then the abstract artists, they really relish paint for paint's sake. Um, that's something that we as representational painters really have to to give them credit for it. like they, their point is completely valid that we have to enjoy the play of paint and we have to enjoy the abstract quality of the paint as we put it down i think the scratching that i put over here was a little bit too much so that feels better okay so i'm going to keep on dancing all over the canvas um while I'm on the milk uh, carton, or milk glass, I keep getting the wrong word today. Um, while I'm on that milk glass, I'm going to start seeing some of the dark darks. Today's a great day for putting in these dark darks up here. I don't really have dark darks, I have general hazy kind of masses. But there are some liquid darks right over here. And some of them can be really sharp, especially up there. So to get that sharp, sharp, I go in, I touch it with a bit of 
the mayor and medium. I touch it with a little bit of turpentine and then I kind of like strike in the direction. I can't do this in too many places because it's not so sharp in, in so many places, but I can put it right here. And I just hit it, I just strike, and then I just leave it. Um, I'll do that a few times. I see it also um, up here. And now, um, an area that I've long had in question is becoming apparent. Um, this is dark on light. Should this be light on dark? That's light on dark right there. Uh, my answer to that is no. I think this should also be dark on light right here. And you could say, well, how did you come to that conclusion? I don't know. I'm just looking at it. And it feels like it breaks up the monotony. I don't want it to be this whole side as being dark on light and this whole side being light on dark. So I feel like it just needs to come a little bit darker. Oh, that was too bright. Right over here. Okay. So, so we're right at the 40 minute mark, a little bit past 40 minutes. Um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to keep writing them in. All right, so again, in the course of this milk jar, you could say, well, how are you going to make that work? Um, I am forever painting myself into corners and trying to figure out how to get out of them. You might even say that it's an unhealthy addiction. Um, so right here, that moment makes no sense with the background. I'm aware of that, and yet I'm not going to let it go. I like that. Um, it requires that the side of the milk container Go a little bit lighter, which in fact it is light over here. So I have to go a little bit lighter here. But do you see how the background is pulsing now? Like there's this real, um, look at how the background breathes. It now goes dark to mid-tone, dark, mid-tone, light to dark. Um, if you just for a moment don't see, don't, don't dwell on, I don't know how to say it. Don't focus on the milk creamer. Focus on the just the background and look at how many transitions there are just behind this creamer. Look at how many moments change. The reason is I don't want perfunctory, like um, something I personally really hate and I feel like a jerk saying this and I'm not, I'm not throwing any school of painting under the bus, I'm not, uh, throwing any particular artist on the bus. I'm throwing a whole type of painting that uh, we as artists can uh, kind of lapse into. It's called academic painting, um, where it's just like formulaic approaches to things that they're not explorative. They're not, you can tell the viewer's not curious. So the, the monochrome backgrounds um, can really just be just drab and academic. Um, I said this another day. Um, I have a friend who's a painter, he's an incredible artist, and he puts in completely blank backgrounds, and it looks modern and, and fun, and it has like a pop to it, like almost like pop art. Um, I love it, it's absolutely great. But sometimes just monochromatic backgrounds, they just look so depressing. Like you don't wanna live with that, there's just nothing to it. Um, I like backgrounds that pulse and breathe and change, um, because in a way, there is no such thing as background. There is no such thing as foreground. It's just two dimensional shapes. Are they pleasing? That's the question. So right here, I have no idea how I'm gonna make that transition logical or you know just work, but I'm really pleased with how that popped that off right there. So I'm not gonna let it go. I'm gonna keep it, even though it makes absolutely no sense. And I'm gonna go even a little bit lighter, right? Okay, so I really, really like the direction this is going in. Um, I'm thrilled with the direction. Um, there's a highlight right here. 
and I can't quite figure out what it is in the room. Like maybe it's the side of the window sash right over there. But to get that highlight, I want to do it with spontaneity. Um, I don't want that highlight to be um, gently painted in and blended, but I'm going to get this brush out. So this is a um, rosemary and it's a bristle uh, brush. And I don't even know what size it is. It looks like it's like a size two. Um, my hands, my brushes, I paint so much that my hands have worn off the labels. Um, so I think it's a size two. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a whole blob of paint. And just going to just bead up the paint right here. That's too blue. I need more white. And still that came blue. Really powerful. So I'm going to start a new lobby mess over here. Okay, look at all the paint I have charged on there. That's a whole lot of paint. I'm going to take it, I'm just going to pull it down. But what is going to be, what I'm looking forward to with this is that it's partially in the shadow. And so there's a moment where it goes light into the shadow. So if I put a highlight in an area that is already light, it's not going to read that much. But when it goes into a shadow, it really sings. And so I'm just going to go like this. And just drag that over. Um, I don't know that that's going to stay, but I see it right now. And so I want to chase after it. Um, it's a little bit brighter right here. And again, like leave, leave some of your, you don't have to blend any of this. Um, I don't like the quality of it at the bottom. There's a huge bead of paint where it's going into shadow. So what I might do is pull it in the other direction and let it taper. But I'm not really blending it. I'm dragging it. There. So there's like a taper. Um, I like that. I think that's cool. So uh, this area over here is feeling a little bit too dull. Um, I dulled it down the other day on purpose, but now it's gone too far. So I need to put like some spark back in there. I'm not going to use this brush for this. I'm going to actually go down. I was talking in the description of today's painting lesson. Um, I was talking about like rivulets. So rivulet, if you've ever like when I was a little boy, I put a garden hose in the backyard down a hill that we had out on the east end of Long Island. And I'd watch with my brothers, we'd watch the water go down through the grass, through all the different stones. And it'd make these little paths through every, between all the rocks, between the grass, between the, the vegetation. And those are called rivulets. Um, I loved that as a little kid. It was so much fun. And tracing like the pathway and predicting where it would go. Painting has a little bit of that in it, where it's almost like you can trace these little rivulets that go up and they hop and they skip and they go around things and it's like light in and of itself the passage of the light is it's it's fun to like trace its course and an artist who does this and whose work i deeply deeply admire is david lafell and david lafell he has these little rivulets in his paintings where it's like you can trace the flow of light in David LaFell's work. And see how that spark changes the whole side of that painting? Uh, what was before like bland and perfunctory over there now actually has some life to it. And then I'm just going to put a little bit more paint right over here to agree with that side. Maybe I'm getting a little bit too creamy over there. Yeah. It has a little bit too much Naples yellow, so I'm just going to hit it. I don't want to go green, but I do want to cool it down, so I'm going to touch it with things blue. And just putting the paint down. And these are really super rich impostos that I'm putting down over here. Um, so we're right at the, I think we're at the one hour mark. I don't even know where we're at. Um, but I just want to say thank you guys so much for tuning in day six. So, uh, um, I will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow's day seven and we'll jump into, um, going to stay really on the same track here 
and uh, one o'clock tomorrow Eastern Standard Time, and I'll see you then. Thanks, guys.